So excited to uh, continue on this morning in our series in the little letter of Jude. If you're joining us this morning, we are in week four of this series, and um, we've been talking about what it looks like to contend for the faith of Jesus Christ that was given us. That's what Jude is writing to this church about. He's concerned about their faith, and he's, he's saying, guys, it's time for a wake-up call. It's time for us to be alert to what's happening in the church. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. And I want you to wake up a little bit. Be sober-minded because there's some stuff going down in the church that's going to ruin the church. It's going to ruin your walk with Jesus if you don't pay attention. And this morning, we are going to be looking at how to recognize false teachers. We're going to be dealing with a pretty heavy subject this morning. How do you recognize false teachers in your midst? But before we jump into that, I wanted to, to talk about a little story that I read about this week. I was looking at a story from 2009 about the war on terror. In the fall of 2009, the National Security Agency, the NSA, uh, intercepted this email from someone who was overseas in Pakistan. He was a terrorist, and he was attempting to communicate with a man who was a shuttle bus driver in Denver, Colorado. The man's name was Najibullah Jaji. Now, Najibullah Jaji had been radicalized by al-Qaeda on one of his trips over to Pakistan many years before, and the two of these men had struck up a relationship, a friendship, and they'd been corresponding over email about how to carry out this devastating bombing attack on the New York City subway system on the anniversary of September 11th. This is pretty serious stuff. So the NSA picked up on what was happening by email correspondence. They alerted the FBI, and the FBI started to tail this guy. They found him living in Aurora, Colorado, and they followed him as he crossed the country from Colorado to New York City, where he began to rendezvous with his accomplices as they began to make the final plans and preparations for this bombing. And in just the right amount of time, the FBI uh, came in, they arrested this man, Naji Bulajaji, they charged him on multiple counts of terrorism, and they really uh, foiled this very dangerous, potentially dangerous, catastrophic attack that these men were going to carry out in New York City. The, the acting U.S. Attorney General at the time, he called it one of the most serious threats to our nation since September 11th, 2001. Why am I telling you this story? Because stopping terrorists is not an easy thing to do. Terrorists wear normal clothing. They blend in with the rest of society. So you don't even know when your enemy is there with you until they unleash their demonic attack in your presence. That's how it happened on September 11th. Many unknowing people on airplanes flying with terrorists who looked just like them, dressed just like them, until they carried out their diabolical schemes. Uh, while I'm really thankful that we have a government that has acted to protect us, that they've stopped countless potential terrorist attacks on American soil, uh, my point this morning is that it's not been nearly as effective. The church has not been nearly as effective as rooting out and identifying potential threats in the body of Christ. Satan is having a field day with the church, infiltrating through spiritual terrorists in the body of Christ throughout America, and I know throughout the world, because his desire is to destroy the church by any means necessary, and especially, as we see in the letter of Jude this morning, from within, by using false teachers in the body of Christ. These false teachers then, as they are now, are men and women who disguise themselves like terrorists to blend in with the body of Christ. They sound like you. They may be sitting among us this morning, dressing like real Christians, talking like Christians, but they have within them a sinister desire and intention to destroy your faith and to destroy Jesus' church, his bride. You might think I'm a little bit overblown this morning. This is, 
um, a little bit exaggerated, but I don't think it could be any closer to the truth of what's happening in the church. We spoke a few weeks ago about how difficult it can be to spot these false teachers, these spiritual terrorists that are in our midst. But it's not difficult to spot the effects of their work. We've seen how once strong and thriving churches and denominations that have dotted the landscape of our nation, churches that were committed, denominations that were committed to the truth of God's word, committed to the gospel, are now only empty shells with giant budgets and endowments compared to who they used to be. Christians who used to walk with a fervent love for Jesus Christ, people that I know whose faith has been upended by conniving professors and pastors and teachers, calling them to be more relative about their faith to the culture that we live in. And so just as our government takes serious its responsibility to fight terrorism, the church has to remain vigilant in the day and age that we live in. Somebody has to be on guard. Someone needs to be watching to thwart these false teachers and their teaching before they destroy our schools and our universities and our churches from within. And if you think that I'm just making all this up, go out and I can send you articles. I can tell you real stories, even within our own denomination, about how this is happening. And it breaks God's heart. And it's because Christians are not standing sober-minded and alert in the word of God and in the truth of God's word. And that's why I believe that Jude's message to us this morning about how to recognize false teachers is so incredibly important for the time that we're living in. These were people who we would refer to today as apostates. An apostate is someone who turns their back on Jesus Christ and denies the Christian faith. And what's interesting is that typically apostates that you know, that I may know, they leave the church once they leave Jesus. But this was a different kind of apostate that Jude was dealing with in this church. Because while these people denied Jesus Christ, they said, you know what, we're going to just stick around in the church. We're going to see how many people we can take out with us, with our teaching and our lifestyle. So Jude was dealing with a rather insidious form of apostasy in the church. So we're going to begin this morning with his words in verses 8 through 10 as we look at how to recognize false teachers who are in our midst. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses... He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people, they blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So the very first thing that Jude tells us is that if we want to recognize false teachers today, that we need to study false teachers from the past. Did you catch what he said in verse 8? He said, yet in like manner, these people also. He's talking about the people before them. Now, you may disagree with me, but I think Jude would have made an awesome forensic sketch artist. You might be like, what are you talking about, Seth? A forensic sketch artist is someone who works with law enforcement to produce a drawing, a sketch of a suspect. And what they typically do is they sit down with someone who was an eyewitness to a crime or something that had happened, and as the person begins describing the different aspects of this suspect, their hair color, their jawline, tattoos they might have, scars that they have, whatever it is, This artist takes all of these details into a composite and draws an incredibly realistic mugshot of the suspect. 
And those sketches are hung up in grocery stores, at 7-Elevens and Sheets. They're posted online. And the purpose of those is that people would recognize that suspect and that they would be brought to justice. And see, in the preceding verses here, Jude is drawing a sketch, if you will, like a forensic artist. He's drawing a sketch of what these false teachers were like. And he used three Old Testament examples to unmask their characteristics. And he said, guys, let me just tell you a little bit about these false teachers in the past so you know what we're looking for today. He said, these guys are like the Israelites. They were the ones who didn't believe, even though they saw God's great miraculous power in their life. He parted the Red Sea. He fed them with manna from heaven. Jude says they didn't believe, even after all of that, and so they were destroyed. But he said they were also like angels, angels who left their proper place, their proper domain, and they came to earth and had sexual relations with women, humans. And as a result, the Bible says that God put them in eternal chains of darkness until the judgment. And he said, third, they were like these false teachers. These false teachers are like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah who indulged in gross sexual immorality. And God punished them with eternal fire. So Jude's using these examples. He's drawing a sketch for us. And he's saying these false teachers who crept into the church are condemned. They're facing the same judgment as Israel, as Sodom and Gomorrah, and as those angels who stepped out of their proper place. He said, in like manner, these people also. Which I think brings us to an interesting question this morning. How did this happen in these people's lives that they denied Jesus and became false teachers? I don't think anybody wakes up one morning and, and says to themselves, I think today I'm going to deny Jesus Christ and, and I'm going to work to destroy the church that I go to from within. Jude's saying that there is a process that people go through by which they initially experience God's presence or his power in their life, and then they become unbelieving and rebellious, and they turn to gross immorality. And so Jude says, I want to tell you how that happens in someone's life. I want to tell you how those professors and those pastors and those people who call themselves prophets and apostles on TV, how they end up in these places when they started out so well. He says in verse 8, these people also who rely on their dreams. These people rely on their dreams and they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. I want to draw your attention first to this because these people are relying on their dreams. They're building their lives on a foundation, a poor foundation. They're relying on their imagination. They're relying on what feels right to them as they construct what they call the Christian faith. The only other place that we see this word Jude uses here, the word dream, is in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Many of you know that's the place where the, the Spirit of God is poured out on Pentecost and the church, and Peter gets up to speak, and he's filled with boldness and, and courage, and he says, when God pours out his Spirit in his last days, he's speaking from Joel. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And he says this in Acts 2, your old men shall dream dreams. This is what he's talking about. This is that same word. So in other words, your old men will dream dreams that were given to them by God. But Jude isn't talking about the same thing here. That's not at all how Jude is talking about dreams to this church. He's actually saying that God would typically give a vision or a revelation or a dream, and the prophet would speak whatever it was that they received from the Lord. And because it came true, it was validated. And it validated the ministry of that person. And then they wrote it down. They documented those words. And that's how we receive the prophecy that we have in our Bibles. 
And you know, there are things in our Bibles that have been spoken of, prophesied about, written about, that have not yet been fulfilled. But we know with 110% clarity that they will be fulfilled because all of God's words that were spoken have been fulfilled. Amen, church? But that's not the case with the people, these dreamers that Jude is writing about. Jude says that these people claim to be dreamers like the dreamers that God gave vision to and spoke to prophetically. They claim to be hearing directly from God, but what they're telling the people isn't founded in the truth. I want you to lean in here with me for a moment because this is an incredibly important detail. I believe it has so much to do with where we are today. These people were so convincing that they got this entire church to believe that they were hearing from God. And all the while, the things that they were saying, the way that they were living in such immorality was leading people away from God in this church. They were preaching that God's grace gave them a license to live however they wanted to live. But they couldn't ground what they were teaching in Scripture. And so they would just tell people things like this. And maybe you've heard something like this before too. You know what? I, I, I had this dream from the Lord. The Lord gave me a vision while I was on my bed last night. I have this word from the Lord, and, and, and they go on and on, and they rattle off these things. And it's not from God's word. It doesn't line up with God's word. And so all they can do is anchor it in their subjective experience, and they, they sell it because they look like the real thing. They sound like the real thing, but they're talking out of their ears, and they're offending God's truth. And Jude says, this is a very serious matter. These people who are false teachers and are relying on their dreams, they can't go around just firing off at the hip. They can't just say, oh, I had a dream. I had a prophetic image. I was on YouTube this week, and I was just watching videos, as I often do, sermons, whatever. And I was listening to a teaching by an apologist. That's someone who defends the faith of Jesus Christ. And just very interesting with what we're talking about this morning. This apologist was using a clip from a very well-known pastor who considers himself a prophetic leader in the United States. And he's from a very pr prominent ministry in our nation. And a few years ago, this minister, this prophet, got up and very confidently, but very erroneously, and falsely, prophesied the results of the 2020 election. And his was not an isolated incident. People were claiming to have had dreams and visions and words from God about who was going to win the election. And I had a dream and a vision. It was very convincing. Tens and hundreds of thousands of clicks on YouTube. And it never happened. Never happened, church. And in this video on this day, I was listening as this prophet was taking ownership for what he had said incorrectly. He said, I'm speaking from the Lord and, and I messed up. And I'm thankful that he did that. But not enough people did that in 2020 when this happened. It led the church, I believe, into great error. People wanting things to happen. And so they were prophesying their desires to happen. And this happens a lot. And I can say this because I are one in charismatic circles. Pentecostal traditions. I went to a Pentecostal seminary. I think I can speak. All right, I have a shingle I can hang out here. Many wonderful, amazing things about the Pentecostal charismatic tradition. I thank God for people who want to, to flow with the things of the Spirit. But there is a gross abuse oftentimes by leaders in that movement to just say whatever and not take responsibility when it was wrong. And people are led astray. I've been to these meetings where I want a word so bad from the man of God, the woman of God. And it leads the church into error when these people proclaim things that they hear are from God and they don't take responsibility when they mess it up. And they mess it up. And I've messed up before too, by, to be quite honest with you. I've given words that have been more out of my flesh, more out of my desire for that person. I've come to realize later that it was just my wish fulfillment. And Judah's saying there's a lot of that going on in this church. 
These people claim to rely on their dreams and talk for God, and they're selling it, and you're believing it, and the church is going down like a, like a garbage dump. And we have to use such discernment, church. We have to use such wisdom when it comes to the things of dreams and visions. And hear me clearly so that I don't get a lot of emails. God clearly has spoken in the Old Testament through dreams and visions and prophecy. He has spoken in the New Testament through dreams, visions, and prophecy. He continues to speak that way. But I believe the problem arises when people use this to legitimize their own desires or have God say something that they want to be true for themselves. I want that person to win the election. I want this to come true for your marriage. God's got good in your life. Well, what if God has hardship for that person? Be careful what you prophesy. Oh, God just has sunshine and rainbows and unicorns in your future. It's going to be great. No, what if God has a path of disability and a handicap and, and, and other kinds of stress, but he uses it for his glory because it's not about my story. It's about his story. Right, church? And see, that's the tweak on the American gospel and the charismatic gospel that, that we have to be so careful about, that it's about me, and I have a good word for you, and God just wants you to live a great life, your best life now, when it's not really about what is in my best interest. It's in what's in his best interest. And these people were soothsayers. They were saying what the church wanted to hear, and they were leading them astray. And they rejected the absolute truth of God's word for the subjective experience of their own thoughts and their own emotions and desires. And we are all, we are all tempted to do that and have a proclivity to do that. I want, I want to make God in my own image. I want God to sound like and, and do the things that I want him to do. And Jude's saying, watch out. Be careful, church. Stand on his un changing truth and his word. Jeremiah 23, the Lord says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I've dreamed, I've dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? Jeremiah is saying, watch out for those who are prophelying. They're prophelying. These are people who are projecting their own deceitful desires and saying, God said this. But God gets even clearer about this in Deuteronomy. We read in Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and a sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Very strong language, church. Very strong language that God is using. He obviously doesn't take delight. He obviously doesn't take lightly somebody who misrepresents his word or leads his people away from the truth. I believe God's saying, even if what that person says comes true, don't follow them. Don't follow them if they move you off of my word. Don't cling to my word. If there's one thing you get out of this whole series about contending for the faith, it's all about his word. I change. My emotions might change tomorrow. I might sound funny, but God's word doesn't change, and his people need to be in the book, and we need to stand on his word because it will keep us from being pushed about by every wind of doctrine. And it's so important and critical in these days. And we're not called to put anyone to death. If you prophesy incorrectly the election or something, we're not going to put you to death. I don't want to be held to that standard. But what we should do is this. We should be very careful about 
about opening ourselves up to people who do that. We should shut our ears off to that type of a teaching or teacher who just wildly goes off. I've got a pulpit on YouTube and millions of people. I can say whatever I want. We should be careful to shut down our eyes, turn off our browser, and not give these people access to speak into our lives. We need to have a critical eye and ear to the things that we're hearing. You see, because these people are dreamers, they were delusional. They were disconnected from reality. And they were saying that they had special revelation, but it wasn't God's revelation. And so Jude says, look, guys, I gave you three examples of the characteristics of, of people who, who are false teachers in Israel and angels in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now I want to give you three characteristics of these people in your midst. It was general before. It was all past tense. I'm, I'm going to tell you now exactly what's going on. I'm going to give you three more. And Jude does this again in the next few verses. Three more examples. He says in verse 8, These people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh. This is how you'll know them. They reject authority, and they blaspheme the, glory, the glorious ones. And when Jude speaks about defiling the flesh here, He's talking about the physical body. And, and when he talks about, about defiling it, he's talking about staining something. Like when you take a garment and you dye it and it changes colors and it messes it up, it's, it's polluting something that's pure. It's taking something that's clean and making it unlovely. And so when he says that these teachers were defiling the flesh, he's referring to the fact that they were living an immoral lifestyle. Even more so, they were living a sexually immoral lifestyle, and they were telling the church to go along with it. I hate that I have to spend so much time as a pastor. People like Seth, you talk way too much about the sexual things going on in our culture. I hate talking about it. There are other sins. There is, there is sin other than just sexual sin. But it is a predominant sin in our nation today because it gets at some of the roots of, of the ways that people look at God and look at their own identity. And they say, I'm a God. I can do whatever I want to do. There's no repercussions for my actions or my beliefs. God made me this way. Well, God made me. If I wanted to be the way I was, follow my heart, I'd be an adulterer. I'd sleep with all these people. We can't just be the way that we feel we want to be. And God made me this way. What, what a mess it would be in the church. And so God has a standard for us. And these people blew apart God's standard. They're like, heck with God's word. I have a word from God in my dreams last night. You can go and pursue that relationship with that guy in your office. You don't need to keep married. Go with what makes you happy. That's the word of the Lord. And this is what they were doing. They were defiling the flesh. And you know, it all comes down to this one question. And you and I have to sit with this question. That question is this, who or what is the source of authority for your life and decision making? Who is the, the source of the authority for the things you say, I'm going to do this and not do that? That's what this comes down to. And these teachers are saying, God said it's okay. We have license to live as we want to live. Go ahead and do it. In Exodus 32, the Israelites were at the foot of the mountain, at Mount Sinai. Moses was on up there with his beard and his sweet robe, and, and he was communing with the Lord, and, <laughs> and he was getting the Ten Commandments to bring down the mountain for the people. And, and, and these people had just seen God work in powerful ways in their life. Not much different than you or me getting up and giving a testimony. God saved my life on the highway this week. I almost died. Or God provided for our financial needs. They had seen those kinds of things of God. And here they were at the bottom of the mountain. And while Moses was on up there, they got restless. And they cobbled together all this gold, and they're like, let's melt it down and make something cool. Let's make a cow. <laughs> I don't know where the, like, I don't know. They maybe saw too many Chick-fil-A commercials. Um, let's make a cow. In verse 6 of chapter 32 says, And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink. And it says, And they rose up to play. If you crack open your concordance, you look at this in the Hebrew, that basically means that they sat down and the people 
had a wild, drunken orgy together at the bottom of the mountain while God was giving his word to Moses on the top of the mountain. And this is exactly what happened to the angels when they came down out of their proper place and had relationships with women. This is exactly what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah with the extreme sexual perversion and homosexuality that happened. And according to Jude, this is one of the defining marks of the false teachers in their midst, that they defile the flesh. They reject God's authority over their body. This is my body, God. You take care of your body, but this one's mine. You can save my soul for heaven. Thank you very much. But I'm going to live however I want to right now. And I'll, I will just say that it's all God's grace. It's all covered under the blood of Jesus. Thank you. And God's word very clearly tells us otherwise. First Corinthians, Paul just says these words. We could, we could spend a whole day just on passages about our bodies being his, purchased by him, temples of, of his presence. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? It's such a precious thing. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So church, honor God with your bodies. And not just sexually, I believe. Honor God with your bodies, with your exercise, with the way that you eat. I'm talking to myself. It just went right back off the wall. It hit me, okay? Not about sexuality, but about my, my diet, whatever. <laughs> I'm trying to be clear here. I'm going to... So the first mark, he said, of these people is that they defile the flesh. They don't care. The second thing he said is that they... Re they reject authority. They just reject authority. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. It, it works a lot better when I do what I feel like doing, and then I just do it. And Jude's saying, these people, they might say that Jesus is living in their heart, but they are rejecting his authority and his lordship over their life. I don't know if you realize this, but like whenever you came and said yes to Jesus, it was more than, as I just mentioned, it was more than just like a ticket to heaven. It was actually like a bending of your knee. And, and you don't ever have to get up from the position of a bent knee. You came and you flew the white flag of surrender to Jesus on the day that you gave him your life. And I hope your white flag is still up. And I need to check mine from time to time to see if it's my flag or his flag. It's flying on top of the mast. And Jude is saying that these people completely rejected Jesus' lordship in their life. And we see this in the behavior of people all throughout the Old Testament. We see this in Moses, his first cousin, Korah, who rebelled against God's authority. The ground opened up, swallowed him and his family. It was a pretty nasty scene. We see this rebellion with the angels who rebelled against Jesus. We see this with the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah who rebelled against God's law, God's way of doing things. And God judged them with fire. See, the definition of being a Christian is that we don't just need forgiveness, but we need and we want Jesus to hold his position of authority in our lives as Lord and Master. So these teachers, these dreamers, defiled the flesh and rejected authority. And finally, Jude says the third mark of their falsehood is that they blaspheme the glorious ones. It's kind of a strange phrase in the Bible. Blaspheme means to curse what is sacred. It means to speak evil of someone. And, and some form of this word blaspheme or slander is in verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10. Jude's trying to get across this message to us pretty clearly. The, the NIV says that these false teachers, they heap abuse. Think about this. They heap abuse on celestial beings. I'm an earthly being. There are celestial beings. And these teachers were going out of their way to talk bad, to talk smack, if you will, about celestial beings. Now, there are different interpretations on this passage. It's not one of the easiest passages to interpret in the Bible. But I believe the, the best interpretation as far as I was able to understand is that these false teachers were blaspheming the good angels. We're not talking about the demons, but they were blaspheming the glorious ones, the heavenly beings 
who were messengers of the Lord, guardians of his presence. And they were speaking about them with such arrogance and insolence, ways that humans were not to speak to celestial beings because they are so much more powerful than we are. Second Peter, which if you read it, has so much in common with Jude, it's almost like they copied each other's notes if you read it. Second Peter, he's writing, he's like, guys, false teachers are coming. Jude's like, false teachers are here. And he says these words about these false teachers in Second Peter. He said, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power than us, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. And all this becomes much more clear to us with the illustration that Jude gives in the very next verse. He says this in verse 9, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, Lord, rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Now, this is kind of one of those places in the Bible, you open it, you're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's kind of bizarre. Like, that's strange. I don't ever remember reading about Michael wrestling the devil for the body of Moses in the Bible. <laughs> well, if you've never read that, you're not crazy. I'll, see, I'll say that first. What we do see in the Bible about this, about this event in history is found in Deuteronomy 34, verse 6, where it says that God, after Moses died, God buried the body of Moses in the valley of Moab, and nobody, nobody knows where his body is, even to this day. So it appears that, that Jude is referencing this event from a book that the early church father, a guy named Origen, uh, said was called The Assumption of Moses. There was this book called The Assumption of Moses. Obviously, a lot of people in the early church read it. They knew about it. And he was referencing this in his writing to this church. And for the sake of time, I just want to focus on the point that Jude is making here about Michael the archangel. Michael's a bad dude. I mean bad in a good way. He's bad in the goodest sense. The church that I used to go to in Tennessee was called St. Michael's Charismatic Episcopal Church. Try saying that. Strange brew of people. Great people. But I was like, what is up with the Michael thing? As you dive into Scripture, you look into the book of Daniel, you look in Revelation, you begin to realize pretty quickly that Michael is the head of God's angelic armies. He was the special protector of the nation of Israel. Imagine having that as like Michael is protecting us. And in this contest with Satan, Michael, this incredibly powerful angel, didn't dare to even rebuke the devil when he was fighting for the body of Moses. The two of them are facing off. And you would think if anybody that you could slander or rebuke or say bad things about if there's anybody you could do that to, it would be the devil, right? Like, the devil's this, and the devil, I've done that before. And in this instance, Michael didn't do that. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. There was a, an understanding of the sense of God's authority in the matters of the human and the angelic. And also a sense that I'm not going to step outside the, the realm or the bounds of what my authority is. I used to go around years rebuking Satan and the devil and telling him to do this and telling him to do that. I remember reading this passage, and I believe God gives the believer authority. We have spiritual authority. There are realms that that works in, but, but here we even see that when Michael contested the devil, that he used Scripture. He used the word of the Lord. When he said, the Lord rebuke you, he was quoting from Zechariah. When Jesus was in his entanglement with the devil in the wilderness, how did he contest the devil? Did he call him names up and down? You're this man, and you're this, and I get it. Jesus quoted scripture. He stood on, on authority of God's unchanging and divine word. 
So Jude says that these false teachers speak evil of angels. They don't care. They're all over the place. They have no spiritual humility. They have no respect. And they even disrespect the angels who gave God's moral law on Mount Sinai by telling people that the angels told them it was okay to disobey God's law and to live however they want. If someone tells you that they heard an angel say something to them, you should be really, really careful. Muhammad started a religion that way. Joseph Smith launched a movement and a religion in the United States. Today it's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All from a vision of an angel, of another authority from a celestial being, from another realm, communicating something to them that sounded and looked and appeared good because of the charisma of the person or whatever other reason. So we have to use great extreme caution. When people tell you, I, I died and I went to hell or heaven, and, and you're like, I got to go get that book right away, and I got to read that. Be very careful, church. We need to stay within the, the rails that we're given, which is the word of God and his authority. Some of those things might be true, but we shouldn't lean on them as if though they are the truth. We must be discerning. And so Jude ends with these words in verse 10. He says, these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed. Here's the end for these people. They are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. They seem so spiritual, but they're actually completely disconnected from God. There's no source. They have no idea what they're talking about. And the things that they pursue, the things that motivate them, all come from their fleshly desires, their fallen understanding, and they act like animals. Boy, does that not sum up some of what we see in the Christian world today? Yep, but by God's grace and mercy for any of us, right? I say that all the time. God, thank you for your mercy and grace. I could be any one of those people, that next documentary, that next book, that next story is written about them and their fall from grace. God, help us. But church, we should be very careful as we follow in the way of Jesus, that we should keep our eyes open, that we should be astute. Fathers, you are the leaders in your home. You are the watchmen. You are the shepherds. You are the guardians of things. Mothers are as well. Some big mama bears, <laughs> strong mama bears. But we must, we must be careful. We must be vigilant about the things that we're allowing ourselves to be fed, our spiritual diet. Don't just read the book that the person hands you because they felt good when they read it because it helped them to live their best life now. I'm not trying to diss Joel Osteen, by the way, okay? But I'm saying there is an American gospel that seems right to us, but in the way it, it leads to destruction. And God has already given us a path to follow. It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't, it doesn't write itself into a story the way that I always want it to. It doesn't always allow me to live out all my desires and feelings and how I feel that I was made. This is the way God made me but it will always lead us into truth and righteousness. It will lead us in a life that honors the Lord and that leads us to vitality. I want that kind of life, and we need to watch out for one another. Maybe you have a brother or sister here today that you're like, I think they're going out on the edge a little bit too far of the branch. Some of that stuff that they're, that they're feeding themselves in their diet spiritually, I'm not sure they know exactly who those are teachers are, what that teaching is, I think you have a place to lovingly speak truth to your brother or sister. If that's me, speak truth to me, right? It tells us to speak truth and love to one another. Would you rather see that person fall off a cliff and spiritually die or be led astray because you didn't say something, because you were afraid of hurting their feelings? Would you? So we need to care for one another. We need to contend for the truth as a church together. 